Welcome to Wireless Future. I'm Emil Björnsson, and as always, I'm here with Eric Larsson. How are you today? Oh, hi Emil. Very good. How are you? I'm great. And today we have a guest, and that is Jakob Hoydis, who is a principal research scientist at NVIDIA. And you might also know that he was the founding chair of the IEEE Comsoc Emerging Technology Initiative on Machine Learning. And uh, yeah, I believe he's one of the, the early visionary voices in terms of using machine learning in, in the communication area. And uh, yeah, he's also been heading a research department at Nokia Bell Lab. So you might have seen him in a number of different uh, situations before. Uh, but recently he has joined NVIDIA and developed a GPU accelerated open source link level simulator for next generation communication systems called Shona. So that is the intention that we will talk about that. So Jakob, welcome. How are you? Yeah. Hi, I'm great. Hi, Eric. Hi, Emil. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. I'm a, I'm a big fan of your podcast and uh, very happy that you have invited me. So. Yeah, it's great to have you here. And we, I was really excited when I heard about this uh, new system simulator uh, or link level simulator. So really would like to, to understand more what it can be used for. So I think we will kick this off by just asking you, what is a link level simulation? Yeah. Um, so... One, one typically distinguishes between link level and system level simulations. And link level simulations evaluate physical layer performance uh, in the most detailed manner, I would say. And that means that one simulates the actual transmission and reception of information bits over a specific channel. And that involves also all of the necessary signal processing blocks, such as channel coding, modulation, synchronization, channel estimation, uh, MIMO detection, and so on. So in other words, um, link level simulations are important to validate the performance of signal processing algorithms, see if they behave well, and um, ultimately, if you come up with a new algorithm, you want to see that um, it leads to gains in an end-to-end -end scenario. And the typical metrics one is interested here are bit error rate or block error rate. Um, and importantly, a link level simulator does not require any information from higher layers, for example, um, the scheduler. I see. So uh, then you mentioned the, the system simulators uh, as well. And I guess I, I happened to say that when I meant link before. So, so what is the, uh, the purpose of those ones then? Yeah, so um, system simulations are then used to evaluate performance of large networks. And typical metrics here would be the um, CDF of the uplink or downlink throughput, so over the entire cell. Um, but as this is computationally very demanding, um, to, to simulate such large networks, one resorts to so-called um, physical layer abstraction. And that means that rather than simulating the actual transmission of bits as uh, what is done for link level simulation, one only computes um, SNIR values um, for each link from which then block error rates are typically obtained through lookup tables. And what's important is that system level simulators um, need to account for higher level components such as um, power control, link adaptation, scheduling, uh, hybrid ARQ, uh, traffic models, and so on. So, I mean, is it fair to say that a link level simulator is a way of developing and parameterizing this abstraction that system level simulators then later on rely on? Yes, to, mm. to some extent, I would say yes. But um, as far as I know, so these physical layer abstractions, they are even, um, I would say, simulated in much in much more simplified settings. So typically, you do you compute um, block error rates over an AW gen channel, and then ultimately you compute an SINR and then just assume, okay, um, this is the operating point on an AWJ an AWJ channel mm. that I'm currently looking at, and then I take this value. Right. So, so now in the context of uh, Shiona, I just learned that it's not Siona, it's Shiona. Is that right? Yes, yes. that's right. <laughs> that's Irish. <laughs> Irish, yeah. yeah. Wow. So in the context of Shiona, uh, what are the link level performance metrics that you guys work with? I mean, some folks look at like capacity bounds, for example, and the capacity bound translates into like effective SINRs and so forth. And others look at bit error rate uncoded, bit error rate with coding, block error rate, and so forth. So what metrics does this system support? Um, yeah, so I mean, typically, we look at coded bit error rate and, and block error rate, because that's what, what matters in, in yeah. most when you develop an algorithm. Mm. 
but um, you could also um, um, you could also compute SINR values after a um, linear detector and then mm -hmm. take it and plug it into a mm -hmm. compute capacity. But typically, when we do these link level simulations, we really care about do we observe gains in coded bit error rate? Mm. Yeah, of course. I mean, coded bit error rate or block error or packet error rate is typically what matters eventually, right? But then uh, sometimes uncoded bit error rate can can be a good enough. A, proxy for that and sometimes capacity or SINR expressions can be but is my understanding correct then that Shiana actually delivers like I mean you parameterize the link you tell the system that this is the environment this is the modulation this is the decoder or uh, which could be potentially I don't know it could be a classical uh, signal processing algorithm right or it could be some trained machine learning uh, black box that does it for us and and, and Shiona will then give us for this set of parameters a, a block error rate as, as a function maybe of signal to noise ratio or, or transmit power and so forth. Is that how it works or could you? No, no not really. No. Okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. so there is something it, it, uh, more hidden so here. No, so there's there's really more, no yeah. magic. There's no magic. There's, it, it's, it's Shiona is actually just, it provides you signal processing blocks like you have an, an, an encoder you have a modulator and in the encoder you feed in a vector of bits and get out a vector of coded bits and then you put it in a modulator it outputs you um, 16 qualm symbols and then you might feed it into an OFDM um, um, a modulator that outputs you a, a discrete waveform and then you can say, hey, I would like now to send this waveform over a specific type of, of channel model. And then this channel model, you do Monte Carlo simulation that generates you random channel impulse responses. You compute the channel, uh, the, the convolution of your input with this channel impulse mm -hmm. response, get an output sequence, and then you do the processing until you finally end up with, with an estimate of the um, bits that were transmitted, and then you can compute whatever you want with it, like mm -hmm. bit error rate, block error rate, and I so see. on. I see. So in that respect, Giona is more like, I mean, in a way, it's like a classical link level simulator then, yeah. right? Where you have the blocks, it's... you have your modulation, you have your coding, you have your channel model, you have your demodulator, channel estimation, decoding, whatever, and, and you get your bits. And then once you get your bits, you can obviously estimate your block error or bit error rate or anything else that you, you wish. But... Furthermore, I mean, from this entire chain, you could also get like an SINR value that could be used as a simple proxy for like capacity by plugging it into a Shannon sure. formula or, or even with a finite block length correction, sure, correction sure, factor sure. and so forth. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. So, uh, I mean, uh, maybe a little yeah, if we take a step uh, back and uh, uh, yeah, we have been talking now about Shana several times. So, what is sort of the, the elevator pitch? What is Shona, if someone asks you? Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, so it's a um, software library for GPU, so graphic processing unit accelerated link level simulations, which has native support for the integration of neural networks in the signal, signal processing flow. And so we use Shona for physical layer research at NVIDIA and have decided to make it available to the community as an open source project. Now, most of Shona is written um, in Python using TensorFlow's Python API. So TensorFlow is a deep learning framework. And the idea behind it is really to make the daily work of researchers easier by allowing one to go as quickly as possible from a, a research idea to, um, yeah, to a simulated working mm. prototype, if you want. Mm. So, I mean, I understand that if you work with machine learning and particularly deep learning algorithms, then TensorFlow is um, uh, one of the standard um, software packages uh, to use. Um, but for many components here, like uh, modulation or, or even channel coding and so forth, um, I would think that just a classical implementation of the standard algorithms would be good enough or even better. So is there like a specific reason for why everything here is built upon TensorFlow? Or is it just that, I mean, there's TensorFlow underneath and it's used for the machine learning components, but for, for the classical stuff, just <laughs> classical algorithms are, are implemented. Could you comment on that? 
Okay, so, so first of all, there is no diff So what we implement are really textbook algorithms. Yeah. So whatever you have there, it's the same. So if mm. you do it, and I don't know if you if you if you if you modulate something using using MATLAB or um, any other um, tool that's available there, you would get the same results. So there's there's no difference. Um, then, there, but there for us, there are two. There there's three, I think, important components. Um, so first one is that it's really open source, and I think our community is is lacking. Um, an open source um, implementation of many standard algorithms. So for example, if you wouldn't really want to get a um, polar polar code implementation that you can use in your simulations, that's open source. There are some things available, um, but um, not, not everything you need. And so I think it's important so that we in our community have like an open source um, implementation of all of these things available. So I think that's very useful. The second thing is that um, as you said, as soon as you want to do something with machine learning, you you, ha you have the problem that um, you you need to interface your link level simulator now with a machine learning library, and then you start to generate with one tool. You start to generate data sets, and then you import it in your in your machine learning framework. Do the training there, and then you kind of need to evaluate. Hey, what happens if I replace a certain block with this uh, trained model? What will happen there? And then you go back into your link level simulator to compute metrics. So things become very um, quickly complicated. And by integrating actually link level simulator with the deep learning framework, you get both. And then comes the thing is, Shona is a differentiable link level simulator. And that's very important. So that means, so essentially we do differentiable programming, meaning you take any or almost any block you have available in Shona and you can get automatically the gradients of the outputs mm. with respect to the input and That's changes. a cool thing. I mean, but how about channel coding, for example? Is that also differentiable if you put in like, a, I don't know, LDPC code or something there, like multiplying with a parity check matrix doesn't sound like a very differentiable operation, right? When you have like yeah. zeros that's and ones. Almost <laughs> every, that's why I said almost every component. Yeah. Um, but for example, so. the BP decoder is differentiable. So mm -hmm. um, the that's, BP, that's yes. fully different. Yeah, that's the fully. Yes, I understand. But okay, yeah. we, we can't we can't yet no, no. <laughs> I think um, learn new codes. So make the parity check matrix uh, parity check matrix differential would be great. But yeah, I I think but, nobody but, has come up with a way of doing it. Right. But at the same time, there isn't maybe a lot of point in trying to learn new codes yeah. either because I mean coding is such a well investigated and, and the, the, the codes that are out there are so good. Right. At least for longer block lengths. I mean they are almost at the channel limit. So. Um, so if I understood this well, I mean, it's like you build the, the entire simulation chain on the data structures and on, on the TensorFlow framework, but then you have, I mean, a number of components that just implement the classical algorithms that have yeah. nothing to do with machine learning or even with TensorFlow itself, but it's just yeah. code. Actually, yeah, that, right? actually yeah. Sh Shona has no, there is no neural network in it. If you download, no. if you download the tool and use yeah. it, um, is it's this a data types from TensorFlow so that it exactly. integrates it, nicely in case you want to use a machine learning algorithm exactly. at some point exactly. in your like the modulator or somewhere? So that does, exactly. yeah, it's great. Exactly. Um, so, w what are the like main competitors here in terms of like other uh, tools that are available? I mean, for, for for one thing, there's like in MATLAB, I think, has some communications toolbox, and then there's this IT plus uh, plus uh, package. I'm sure you know, written in C plus plus that I don't think it does polar coding. Actually, I don't know with certainty, but I know for a fact it does add the PC coding because I wrote that module some 10, <laughs> 15 years ago. <laughs> uh, what, what other like competing um, software packages are there? Um, or, or who's your like main competitor? <laughs> I, 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 I like to avoid. I like to avoid talking about com com competition because that's yeah, not, not, yeah. Not, not, not how I really see it. Um, so obviously. Um, you can do most of the, you know, first of all, there is there is no differentiable link level simulator. Mm -hmm. So with respect, there is no competition. That's the reason why we developed Shona. Um, so, but for example, if you are really into channel coding, there is a, it's an awesome open source library called Effect. And I think they have state of the art implementations from everything. So for this specific kind of, let's say, um, niche, um, I don't know if coding is not a niche, but for this specific mm -hmm. uh, research mm -hmm. sub-community, mm -hmm. that's a great tool. Mm -hmm. And I think then there are um, quite a few open source channel simulators 
So just to, to generate channel impulse responses, there's this um, great tool NYU SIM, for example, um, that, that, that really, that's really, that's really good. There's Quadriga. And so they do the channel simulation part. But then um, if you now want to use these channel impulse responses in a link level simulator, then you need to import it. Um, yeah, and, and then you're back working with multiple tools at the same time. Yeah, sure. So in but Shona, you can also import these channel impulse responses if you want from other sources, but you don't need to. Yeah, right. But but Shona like interface to any of the other. I mean, suppose you wanted to use this. Uh, say the name again for the uh, the open source toolbox for for state of the art algorithms in coding. Suppose you wanted to uh, like import some particular, I don't know, exotic polar code or LDPC code or something and, and, and just run it in Shiona, could you interface then with those libraries or are you more um, like a, a closed, well-defined simulation chain that, well, as long as you're within this like TensorFlow framework, then you can program anything, but you can't really interface too much with like other packages. Could you comment so, I mean, on that? Ultimately, everything goes through Python. And so what, whatever you can interface to in Python, yeah, which clearly, is everything. I mean, um, clearly you could always you, convert to data types, but you'd like the interface so, to be clean enough somehow so that, um, I mean. So especially whenever you do this, you will lose this um, differentiability. Yeah. So whenever you interface mm -hmm. with something else, you will lose this, but you can. And for example, so what, what I found the most important thing is actually that you can use, um, that you can import channel impulse responses from any source you want. So you can have measurements, you might have done some ray tracing experiments, or you want to use another channel simulator, you can just import it and then simulate transmissions over it in Shona. I felt that is important. Um, now there is support, for example, you can import any uh, parity check matrix if you want, you want and then use it. And there's a an universal encoder and you can run any BP decoder on it. But now if you want to, for example, have a very specific implementation that you find in one open source library, mm -hmm. um, you can't really use it i mean um not without some some tweaking yeah some, and, and, <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah i get that i mean you'd have to write some some function that interfaces these libraries then. but i mean it sounds to me that the main innovation here is really this differentiability right you can actually i mean yeah well in a way back propagate to train like machine learning algorithms that's a cool thing I, uh, I, <laughs> that's one thing um and there's the other thing that's the gpu like acceleration um and that makes things really, really, really fast. And then for me, that's that's a game changer because um, you need to think about when you when you run. Um, I don't know when you when you typically run Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, often you have a for loop where you say for <laughs> you iterate over one million iterations, then simulate things one by one. On the GPU, you do this in one shot. You say generate me one million. You know transmissions of a code block and you get it instantaneously yeah so it's like the use of gpus allows for massive parallelization yes. of certain operations right i mean as long as you stay within i guess the realm of like vector uh, matrix multiplications and that sort of things but perhaps even like in a channel decoder i mean you have the uh, um uh, the the uh, box plus operation right in the bleed propagation uh, for example i suppose they could also be parallelized in a similar uh, fashion so hmm. so we mentioned the uh, channel this and particularly how you could potentially uh, import something from other sources but what kind of channels can you generate within shana because i i'm thinking that this is one of the discussion items that always comes up when we are going to run simulations in my group what selection of parameters should we have and then yeah we in the end we we select something simple and uh, that has a name and that's it <laughs> exactly yeah so so first of all we have the the really the basics um the basic textbook models awgn uh Rayleigh fading uh, ready failing with arbitrary um correlation if you want and these models are great if you simulate a um like a frequency flat fading channel um and you don't care so much about mobility and then we have implemented the um the full specification um, of 3GPP called 38.901. So I think many um, people know this under the names of uh, TDL, CDL, urban micro, urban macro, rural macro cell. So mm -hmm. these type of models. Um, so TDL and CDL are actually simplified versions of Yumi, Yuma, and RMA. And we have implemented them all. And um, so these are the models that are used actually for 5G um, specification. And I would say the, the current gold standard in industry. And, um, and we felt, and, and what I had experienced in the past was that I was 
generating channel impulse responses for this model um, in another tool, created a huge data set that becomes quickly very large, and then import this into, um, into my TensorFlow environment to, to, to simulate things on top of it. And we felt that there was a huge gain of integrating this directly into Shauna so that you don't need to create data sets anymore and switch between tools. And yeah, and so now with one line of code, you can actually um, go from Rayleigh fading to something, um, yeah, 3GPP um, compliant, if you want, and make things more interesting. Yeah, I, I think we, we were discussing this at, at one point as well, that the, this 3DPP compliance is, is important if you really are into pushing your ideas in standardization and things like this. So uh, what are the sort of important sort of features that exist in this 3DPP model compared to if you just hack something simple together yourself? I, I remember we talked, for example, about something called spatial consistency once. Oh, yeah. Okay. So... um. Um, so, 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 so first of all, these are so-called stochastic um, geometry-based models. Essentially, when you, you, you place a, an antenna, a base station somewhere, a user somewhere, and then um, you actually the, the channel impulse responses you can get draw from these models do not correspond to any um, precise physical environment but you try to mimic the um, stochastic behavior that has been obtained through measurements. And what's typically defined for a link is you have multiple um, so-called clusters from which you get reflections that arrive essentially at the same time at the receiver. And each of these clusters uh, is, has an angle of departure and angle of arrival associated with it. And these are drawn randomly depending on, on the scenario that you've selected. And then you also draw randomly the, the past delays that you get for these things. And then, um, based on this, you essentially um, apply um, yeah, some of senoids to, to actually generate a time-evolving um, channel impulse response. And then you can apply on top of this antenna patterns and, and also MIMO arrays, where you just compute the corresponding phase offsets. And that's how you generate um, channel impulse responses from it. And um, so you have all of the practical effects. So you can say, uh, how fast does a user move? And this depends, this is really potentially determined then the Doppler spread, um, the antenna orientations are taken into account leading to different, um, yeah, different correlation, um, directivity uh, that impacts the rank of your channel and so on. Um, yeah, so you're, so you're sort of creating this kind of random environment with clusters of things, and then you move around in that one, and things and then are you consistent. Move, you essentially say, I move, now I make tiny steps from this point where I was dropped, and move for, I don't know, a couple of milliseconds, and generate essentially a snap, so as a sequence of channel impulse responses at this point. And then you essentially make another drop, and you start again. <laughs> and mm. now I think, so with respect to, um, I think, um, spatial consistency. So um, the problem you might have with these models is that when you place, you drop two users almost at the same position, directly next to each other. Um, by default, they can get angle of arrivals that are totally different. Meaning, although we are next to each other, I get a strong <laughs> reflection from the right, and the other user get ones from the left, which does not make um, are you physically speaking, much sense. Uh, Jacob, you're speaking of like uh, existing old models here, right? That no, that's offer. the 3GPP. That's the 3GPP models oh, yeah. by I default. Mean, the existing, the 3GPP, but they, I mean that, that that obviously has these weaknesses, right? That no, that's why I wanted to come to the point so that there's now this so-called spatial consistency. This has been introduced. Into the um, into the three GPP models, and what happens is then to avoid that users that are located close to each other get these highly different channel responses, you correlate spatially all of the random variables that are used to generate channel impulse responses to kind of mimic a um, yeah a, as if you mimic a actual physical environment that you're simulating. But I but I think it's still very different from what you would get when you do actual channel measurements or when you do ray tracing. Hmm. So it, it seems like uh, Shana is, is really capable in, in terms of both uh, like, like all the signal processing methods that are there and, and this uh, 3DPP kind of models. Uh, then I, I wrote you, or read your white paper where you write, despite the fact that Shana supports 5 d compliant channel codes and channel models, it does not try to by any means to be 5D compliant like level simulator. So then I was wondering, <laughs> uh, is there something that is truly missing or is this something just that the legal department needs you to ask? 
<laughs> no. Okay. Okay. That's a, that's a good question. No, but so the reason um, we wrote this in the paper is the following. So Shauna is a tool for research and not a 5G simulator, right? We want to do something else and simulate 5G performance. And we do not want to be limited by anything that the standard describes. Now, the 5G channel models, I think, are great because they can be used to evaluate performance of any scheme you want to try. You know, you can simulate a 4G system over a this channel model or something new you come up with, do OTFS over this channel model. And, and also the same holds for the channel codes, as uh, Eric just said. I mean, these codes are great, right? And so, and I think it's important to have them available for benchmarking simulations. So if you write a paper and say, hey, I, I, I evaluated with this um, 5G uh, compliant channel code, I think it gives a lot of credibility to your results. And um, so that's why I think it's, it's, it's really um, important to have it available. However, I don't think that's a need for research to implement um, a 5G specific um, OFDM frame structure where you distinguish between control and data channels and have precise piloting schemes and so on. So I think for most research purposes, um, it's good enough to have, for example, a flexible of the frame structure where you have full control and freedom to do whatever you want. And yeah, and I mean, being compliant with the standard makes things very complicated. And that's the opposite of what we want to achieve uh, with Shona. Mm. Yeah, I mentioned, uh, you mentioned 5G, but I had the impression that Shona was thought of as a tool for 6G. Is that, uh, is that a right understanding or... Uh, yeah. How should we think about that? So, but but then for I mean in in, in that context, then what is really new here? F what is six G about it? In the sense that I mean, w w what's new that could not have been or would not have been relevant like five years ago? Um, yeah, or even longer. <laughs> yeah. So I um. So I mean, there are, there, there are a couple of things that are new. I mean, obviously, um, machine learning is now well established mm. and i think it's very important for any link level simulator to write a very nice interface to machine learning tools mm. when you say interface and you really mean a, a native interface yeah. that facilitates the use of machine learning based methods at the receiver end right like and and, and i mean anywhere wherever, wherever you want mm. I think wherever you want. So I think that that's one part. And there are some people looking into um, AI native networks and then trying to figure out if something could be um, actually even standardized using AI. So I think for this type of research, I think it, this is just important to have it there. But then I think there are quite a few new, new topics, um, such as um, uh, integrated sensing and communications. You have these reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, um, terahertz communication, semantic communications. And um, for quite a few of them, for example, specifically the um, integrated sensing and communications and, and RIS topic, um, you can't read. The problem is that the channel models we have available don't really work well because you really need to simulate a physical environment, right? If you want to do radar-based sensing, you can't use um, a, a stochastic channel model for it. And so I think, therefore, we need to resort increasingly to ray tracing to do 6G research. And I think the same holds for RIS. Um, and that's one direction which you want to go um, with Shauna, but maybe you can talk later about the ray tracing um, aspects. Um, and then there's also this idea of multimodal sensing. So there are people looking into, hey, um, I might have a, a camera um, that tries to help um, what a base station um, is doing. And then, for example, how now you need to generate a visual representation of a scene and get the channel impulse responses from it. And right now, there is no tool that can do actually both. So you need to uh, maybe use um, a rendering machine like Blender and then use a ray trace and then mm. combine the two. And I think with Shona, we're really trying to bring all these functionalities um, together. Yeah, so I can see, I mean, the machine learning aspect that there's been a lot of new algorithmic developments over perhaps the last, say, five years in terms of like algorithms for receivers or even trained end-to-end -end physical layer solutions, right, with modulation coding, even MIMO and so forth. But I still feel like there's a need to separate a little bit here. On one hand, link level simulation for communications, and on the other hand, channel modeling right using more physics based like uh, techniques you mentioned ray tracing or i mean clusters and then you move a little bit and, and see how the impulse won't change and so forth 
Um, cause, cause that's really a separate thing, I would argue. I mean, you could be interested in radar, not caring at all about link level simulations, right? And all you'd care about is like, what are the scattering center? What does the speckle look like? And so forth. And, uh, but so in a way it, it occurs to me that Shiona here does like both or aims to <laughs> aspires to do both. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, no, that, that's true. That's true. So I think I mean, my, my ultimate vision would be, um, get rid of these channel models and do, um, if you can do it fast enough, um, to do ray tracing, um, in the, in these kind of simulations, um, if you yeah. want to. So, uh, obviously one of the good features here is the differentiability and that you can sort of take an, uh, state of the art algorithm or textbook algorithm and swap it out for some machine learning parts there. So uh, you have been working for quite a while on machine learning improvement on the physical layer. Uh, how large improvement do you anticipate that, that it could be? Because uh, on the one hand, you, you sort of, when you're teaching the, the fundamentals from textbooks, we try to say, ah, this is an optimal code or this type of things. And then you go out there in reality and people say, ah, we will improve things with machine learning. So, so, so what do you anticipate? Right. Okay. I mean, okay. Um, so if you work on idealized models, like take the AWGN channel, uh, where you already know that your solution is optimal, then machine learning will not be able to do any miracle. <laughs> so you, in the best case, you are as good as your solution. But there are, so over the, over the last years, I have now observed quite a few cases where there is a lot of room for improvement. Um, so one example for exa uh, is the um, random access channel, those are the, the PRAJ, for example, in, in 5G, where you need to detect um, a certain preamble, estimate um, carrier frequency of and timing, timing offset, and there fully learned solution can, can really achieve substantial gains here. So you might in some scenarios gain 10 dB in, um, in detection performance, for example. Or another area where fully learned solutions shine is um, when you do um, OFDM uh, reception uh, under very high um, Doppler um, sp spread scenarios. Um, there you can actually, you, you, you observe really, really, really a couple of dB gains and you can actually get these gains with almost no pilot uh, demodulation reference signals if you want. So you can gain a couple of dBs here. Now the question is, this is nice. Um, it's not, you know, it's not a 10x improvement. And I'll, I don't think we probably see it on the physical layer. No, but still a couple of, couple of dB is not bad, right? But I think the real question here is whether are these problems where there just aren't any good classical algorithms or are these problems that have been maybe a little bit neglected because the academic community didn't want to or be too interested in <laughs> working on them or is it like fundamentally that a trained approach would do better? Yeah. I'm, I'm not so certain. I mean, really, I mean, I... I appreciate the fact that these learned algorithms do work very well, but that in itself doesn't necessarily mean that one could not design classical algorithms that also would function rather well, in fact, and operate at rather low complexity. Yeah, so, so the thing is, um, let's take, for example, this um, Praj detection. Um, I don't think that there is any good algorithm that takes into account and you have a channel with when you essentially have a channel with memory a bit because you always correlate you have a sequence you correlate it you look for a peak and you try okay that that's the one and this works well on an awgn channel but as soon as you have memory or you have um uh, strong cfo it just it, the theory falls apart and yes. and um so we don't know what to do. Maybe the thing is just here that these are problems that haven't attracted the attention that they really deserve, right? They aren't clean enough for many in academia to, to be willing to work on them because you can't derive like provably optimum algorithm or closed form um, error probability trade-offs and so forth. And uh, therefore nobody has really worked on them. And, and the solutions that are considered baseline and state of the art here are, are really simple and don't therefore don't per perform very well. And then it's not a huge surprise. I mean, that you buy a trained algorithm can gain several dB then. So it's, it, it sounds to me to be more like problems that are being neglected. You know, I've encountered this a lot myself in the past that there are problems that are horribly important in wireless system design, but that nobody in academia wants to work on. Like control signaling might be the best example, how to optimize and detect the bits and so forth. And, and whereas you can find countless of papers on MIMO 
pre-coding using this MMSC or that <laughs> MMSC and so forth. Why? Because it's the, the math is beautiful and you can prove enclosed forms some <laughs> capacity and so forth, right? So that'll be like this notion of papers that, <laughs> that, that, that address them. But th- that, of course, in itself doesn't mean, don't get me wrong here, I mean that a trained algorithm could not be the way to go even because it could be perhaps that is just so efficient when you implement it on silicon you could even leverage your your gpus and, and all this parallel framework and so forth but i just wanted to state the point that uh, these might also be to some extent problems that just haven't been carefully investigated using conventional techniques and that's why the the, the gains are so large right that that's that's a possibility so that i would yeah. challenge the community <laughs> to look, look look at these often problems <laughs> uh, no, but, but, um, but but there's actually another area and i think that's that's i think that has received a lot of interest from academia and i also think that there's no good solution um and and that's it um i think some people call it massive unsourced random access mm. so we essentially have many devices that try to send very small data packets and the problem is that from an information theoretic point of view, um, the classic approach where you would split such a short packet into a preamble mm. and data is suboptimal and would be better to do things essentially jointly. And there we have observed that um, you can generate essentially to learn to can you, um, send self-contained radio bursts that just convey, let's say, a few bits of information much more efficiently mm. than um, than a traditional solution. Mm. Yeah. So I could imagine that for this for this type of area, massive IoT traffic, there this could really pl- uh, also play a role. Absolutely, but I think that might rather be a consequence of the fact that the approaches that have been considered in the literature, because this is still a bit of an a niche topic or even an ascent emerging topic, right? These approaches are rather simplistic in their basic architecture like as you said sending a preamble and then sending data symbols which is by no means optimum right and of course it's a hard nut to crack if you if you rather just pick uh, i don't know from a code book randomly where, where the preamble is like just an integrated part or and then you do optimum non-coherent maximum likelihood detection that's a tough algorithmic problem where nobody really has a good solution and where even solutions using classical methodology are likely to be somewhat ad hoc and uh, certainly, I mean, that sounds like a field where uh, trained algorithms could uh, could have a role to play. Yeah, and I and I yeah. wanted to make one one last point um, yes. <laughs> with respect to with respect to um, I think there's a um, another angle to it than just performance gains, um, so which is the simplicity of implementation. Um, uh, so, I mean, anyone who has ever implemented like a full OFDM receiver knows that it's very complicated, right? But you can actually train one um, mm. with based on neural network in a couple of hours. It's just, and, and you get better or even the same or even mm. better performance. And now, so um, I'm not but, saying but that I this is what we rebut, should be doing, so, yeah, Jacob, but, I but, but I think, yeah, it's going to go ahead. I, no, no, I have to rebut that. I mean, so when you say you, you train an OFDM receiver and so forth, does this mean training the entire thing? Because the way an OFDM receiver works is that you have an analog front end rate and then you sample with an ADC and then you have a sampling rate converter and you have a digital filter and so forth. And these are highly optimized pieces that go on silicon and, and, and essentially do the, the, the sampling rate conversion and, and, and the digital filtering simultaneously and all integrated right and, and, and then there's an FFT and so forth uh, so, so the question is I mean at what point in this ah, chain oh, yeah. do you really start and, and, and with this training like based approach and <laughs> where I, you <laughs> I was, yeah good, no, good, good point you get good your point. baseband so, samples yeah. in you know in your python script right that's not what you get actually from the antenna or even close to what you get from the antenna <laughs> so. yeah, it's, yeah, you just do import antenna no yeah, so yeah. the thing is uh, I, I, tip, I, I typically refer to either um, a post, post FFT yeah, I see. Post Got FFT, mm-hmm. some, something like this. Yeah. So but still, like the estimating reminding... channels, interpolating the channel estimating response and all that. Yeah, Computing mm-hmm. LLRs and these kind of things. And just so easy. And for example, but, but I just made this as, an, as one example where, I mean, I think we will resort in the future increasingly to machine learning just because it's much easier to train a model than to write an algorithm. Um, I, I don't, you know, I don't want to say let's get rid of theory and forget yeah, about understanding so what's know. going on. <laughs> it's just for for some small problems, I think engineers will 
face in the future, I mean, there is a simplicity that you have this tool that allows you mm -hmm. to come up with a working solution very rapidly. Why not do it? Yeah. So, um, no, no, that I can um, concur, obviously. So from, I'm <laughs> that's not how we should do research, <laughs> but at least I just think from a practical point of view, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Um, so I think another concern that one could have here is that you argued for the use of channel models that are based more on like physical models, right? And ray tracing in particular. When I speak to propagate folks who do propagation, then I, I actually ask this question. So why don't you guys just do ray tracing? So you have a geometric model. Here's the room. I have these walls and the table here and you know the shelf over there and so forth. Why don't you just do like ray tracing and then you simulate? So here's my antenna, it moves a little bit every 10th wavelength or something would just recompute the faces of all the reflected and scattered paths and so forth. And one thing I learned from that discussion that I had was that, well, it isn't as simple. I mean, for visual, for optics, it actually is. You can do extremely well as when a photorealistic rendering through ray tracing, right? But for, for RF, then there will be other factors that affect, for example, well, these are concrete walls I'm sitting here now in in the studio and so there might be rebars um, integrated into the concrete right and, and, and the rebars they aren't visible we don't even know where they are and they will serve to maybe scatter or depending how, how densely <laughs> the, yeah. I mean, how <laughs> dense the rebars are they, they, they might even just absorb the thing but um, so even anything close to a physically realistic ray tracing model would require extremely precise knowledge of not only what we can see with a bare eye from photographs, but also what goes like behind the materials, the roughness of, of the walls and so forth. So, I mean, I don't want to, I mean, I'm, I'm hardly like an expert myself on propagation modeling, but so I can only rely on what, what others and experts say. But the way I understood at least is that this is a tough call to actually do any sort of anything that comes close to physically realistic ray tracing. And that's the reason for why in, in propagation modeling that people tend to re resort to these simple models with clusters, you throw out some scattering points and so on, right? Even I mean, you don't even model reflections. If you have a wall, then you just rather than modeling reflections at the wall, you put up, you, you model it through a number of scattering points and that's it. Um, because I see a risk here and the risk is that now your ray tracing model might be quite good, let's say. Uh, and then you train your algorithms and your, um, well, you, you run your link simulation and then you train algorithms that do well on the channel model that your ray tracing, uh, your ray tracer gives you. But isn't there a risk here that we like train algorithms that work well on some sort of quasi physical <laughs> models when I go out in, yeah. in the field and actually get real impulse responses, they don't work as well. Um, so that's a concern that I'd like to voice yeah. and maybe hear your views on also, uh, Jacob. Yeah. No, I mean, first of all, I, I, I agree that propagation modeling is very complicated. And I think, so, for example, diffraction, just to make it simple, is a, is a huge problem in, in ray tracing. I think it hasn't really properly been solved. I mean, there's simplified um, uh, approximations to it, but I think it's, it's not yet done. Um, so now what, where I, I kind of think where, where things might be going is the following direction. I, I think we should probably will not succeed in creating, let's call it a digital twin of, um, of an environment. So, and we shouldn't probably not even, I don't see what would be the purpose of really trying mm -hmm. to model exactly. Um, and it might not even be physically any possible, I tell you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, look that, at this globe here, right? I mean, it's from, I don't know, the 40s or 50s, I think even. It's very old. And how do you know what's inside? Is it hollow? Right. Is there some kind of like stuffed with, I don't know, some foam or, or paper or, or something? I don't know. The only way of finding out would be an X-ray thing or take a knife and destroy it, which I don't want to do, right? So there's just no way you could model accurately propagation uh, with that sort of objects. And, and this is a simple thing that sits on the shelf or the table here. But now you think about it like a complete room or even not to mention outdoors, right? How would you actually do this? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think you can't. So, but where I think the value of um, ray tracing or for research um, would be, so even if it's just a simplified um, model, is that you actually get something that's 
say it's call it um physically co consistent meaning as i said you don't get these weird artifacts where that you I can fully get... appreciate and, and and in a way it's a bit surprising i mean that the 3gpp models aren't better than that right or more realistic than that because if you can get yeah that i think it has never been so that's that's coming back to the 6g discussion i think until now nobody wanted to do something with these channel models that require it so i don't i wouldn't blame 3gpp for them i think these models are great so i would actually say now there are these new use cases where people want to do communications and sensing or you control suddenly start to control the environment and, and see things and that's for the first time where we actually need this um yeah physically consistent modeling of, of, of the channel and i think so now with ray tracing this allows you to do this type of research and now we actually need to see okay if i can now demonstrate um in a ray traced environment that my algorithm shows gains or that I can do something I couldn't couldn't do otherwise. Then this justifies to do it in, in practice and then we need to validate does it actually work uh, in absolutely practice. Absolutely, point or... is well taken. I mean, that'll be like more convincing to most people um, probably than whether, you, rather than when you could, that you just you could demonstrate that it works with, okay, this correlated Rayleigh fading model or, or something, right? So I, I certainly appreciate that. I mean, my concern was only here that isn't there a risk that we like overtrain and, and design algorithms to just invert the simulation model rather rather than functioning <laughs> ah, okay. in in uh, in the true reality? Yeah, I mean, so then there's so now with respect to um, um, I think overfitting or essentially to um, to your simulator, I would I would say so the thing is um, what I mean what you typically want to do when you do machine learning right you have a data set and you assume that it's kind of created by a data generating distribution that's your environment right and in the best case you learn perfectly the data generating distribution now if it if it turns out to be our simulator that's flawed uh, then you have learned this but if you have a um, but if uh, and now the thing is um what you then care about is how well will it do when i de when i deploy it and now if you deploy your system somewhere where the um where you have a different data generating distributions um then your model most likely is not going to work so the only way to to avoid this is by you know training on a better data set training on real data i think there's no way around training on real data no. anyway we're training um, on, on uh, rich enough or diverse enough data sets right because in the end yeah. i so, mean you'd like yeah methods that work without too much of prior knowledge or yeah, and yeah. there i strongly disagree <laughs> so i actually think the, i i think where machine learning will really shine is when you can overfit to a specific scenario so imagine you have a receiver that sits in a factory hall it will only see this factory hall so it doesn't need to work in a high i don't know doppler scenario or whatever and so now if you can let your receiver algorithm overfit to to this very kind of limited set of channel realizations we'll ever see for example um that's probably something where you can gain a lot with respect to methods that would work uh anywhere at, at you know at any time yeah I, I i think we don't disagree as much as the discussion maybe <laughs> suggests here <laughs> yeah i think the point is rather yeah no no okay. i mean the point is rather that i mean we'd like to build and develop basic technology that works without prior knowledge right but then obviously could be in, it's working so performance could be improved by having it learn the characteristics of let's say a specific environment so we build this wireless right. system so here's the access point here already whatever terminals and so on and then we just throw them out there in the field the system just works okay but if we now put them up so the access point in a factory nothing changes there for like a year right and the, the topology the machines don't move or anything then uh, it's of course just a bonus if the system with this access point can learn that look i seem to be in an environment that's just perfectly static right and there is are these multi-pads and so forth and i can exploit that and minimize the latency and all all, all, all the rest so uh, i i think in that respect <laughs> we actually do agree okay Jacob. great okay <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is good yeah <laughs> Yeah, and I think what we are circling around a bit here is the fact that there are two sort of things that we learn when we design an ML-based algorithm. One is to sort of solve a problem in a general perspective, and that is where, uh, well, maybe textbook solutions could be used as an alternative. And then the other thing is to sort of narrow down the applicability of the algorithm to a specific scenario and then get this large gain from sort of overfitting for that situation.
So one thing that uh, I spent quite some time to sort of push is sort of the, this reproducibility in terms of research. And I think in the ML community, uh, uh, particularly maybe in like uh, image processing, there's these huge data sets that everyone is evaluating their algorithms on, a num large number of them. And then I've seen for a while in the wireless uh, research uh, journals, sort of people always create their own simulation environment. So I, I propose an algorithm and I simulate and show that it's better than uh, some baseline. And then someone else comes with a new algorithm and say it's better than mine. Fine, I, I, I take that. But then they evaluate it on their own system model and you don't know if they cherry picked something that where they were beating me or if they were, uh, it's always like that, it's just randomly or purposely. Uh, so I think one of the good use cases of uh, Shauna, for example, is that now there is sort of much easier for people to always evaluate things using the same channel models. Uh, uh, yeah, provided that these channel models are are applicable enough, so we are not sort of overfitting on uh, and, and missing the bigger picture. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I fully agree. I think our community has a massive uh, problem with reproducibility, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's exactly as you said. So for my, most papers, there's no code or data sets available. If they're available, uh, you might still not be able to run the code because there are missing dependencies. Um, and yeah, and, and so with respect to, to data sets, I think there's also this component of tools, right? In, in the machine learning community, you, you do not only have the data sets, but also most people publish their code using popular open source frameworks such as TensorFlow and PyTorch. And, and that also helps a lot because everyone's working with the same tool and then someone has published their code, you can immediately use it and then compare it with your research. And to, to, to and I think in our community, um, that such a tool is kind of missing. And um, that's, that's to some extent the, the gap um, that Shona tries to fill. Uh, let's see if we are going to succeed or not. Um, yeah. I um I fully agree, and then so and, and also I think that we have compared to the um, um let's say the computer vision community, they, there are many people, maybe even thousands of people, focusing on the same problem, right? To say let's may work on object detection or something like this. In our community, we don't have one thousand people focusing on a I don't know um, MIMO detection or this. So you have rather we have thousands of small problems, and you have a handful of people working on them, and so therefore I don't think we will ever succeed in having this one huge data set with this one well-defined problem that everyone's working on to make progress. Rather, we have these many problems people are working on, but still it would tremendously help if we were using the same kind of tool or environment, the same channel models conditioned to evaluate our things. Um, so I think maybe we the it's not the common data set, but maybe the common um, simulation environment with that, would, that would help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really a commendable ambition, I think, to build that environment. And um, I mean, I think Emil's point was just that, I mean, isn't there a risk if everyone is testing the algorithm on a specific ray traced model from Jacob Hoyt's environment that we would just uh, optimize it closely for that particular model, right? Rather than for a more diverse set of conditions we find in reality yeah. and so forth. But in any but case. I actually, I actually, you know, I, uh, but, but I um, come, coming back to this. So I think that's why. Um, it would be already great if, if we, you know, these, these three GPP models, for example, they are super rich, super versatile. I think they are also fairly realistic and it would already be great if more people were using this and that you can say, hey, I have simulated my MIMO detector on the CDL A model and then someone else does the same and not coming up with uh, a new correlation model and uh, yeah, so I mean, it's it's really a nightmare to compare things if it's not compared under the same uh, conditions. So um, uh, yeah, and, and then I also see, I mean, with respect to 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 risk. Um, so I think we need, I mean, two types of research, right? There's this one type of research that tried to make specific algorithmic improvements for a well-defined problem like MIMO detection, and and for this, it's really crucial to get exact performance results that you can compare. But um, the other type of research, which I think is 
maybe even more important from in, in academia is that of you know gaining fundamental insights and and obtaining fundamental limits scaling laws and so on and then this for this type of research reproducibility is maybe not much so an issue because you have the mathematics right everyone can prove that it's correct and you can probably use simple and mathematically tractable models to obtain this fundamental insights and so i mean as long as you have a good balance between um, these two types of research i think we are good so the only risk would be if now more and more people jump on work on this niche problem and trying to gaze 0.3 db on this specific uh, narrow scenario that would probably not be so helpful mm. Great. So I think we should start to wrap up the discussion about Shona because we wanted to ask just a few short questions about your, your previous work as well. But uh, yeah, uh, have people started using Shona yet? Um, yeah, I mean, there, were, there are quite a few groups that have started to use Shona. I mean, we did, released it two months ago and it's too early to, to have um, uh, many, many papers appear using it. I think I just checked uh, yesterday and there's a first paper that uses one of the channel codes uh, and Shona as a benchmark. That's great. But I think more and more papers will, will follow um, this year. Mm. Uh, and can people contribute to this open source project or is it just like passive usage of it? No, def definitely. I mean, the whole point of an open source project is um, that people can contribute and we need actually um, community contributions because we are not experts on on anything and now there are various ways how you can contribute so first of all you can just use it and let us know about bugs things that don't work so you file a, a bug report in github um, or you can even propose a fix through a pull request um, then there's a discussion forum where you can just say hey i would like to do this uh, it would be great to have this feature enabled or if you say hey i'm work on a terahertz channel model and uh, is there a way to bring it into a sh shona to make it available we are happy to have a discussion and see how we can facilitate this um this is all possible and then there's another way um we we, we think about um um letting the community contribute is that we want people to make their shona based research available to the community for example to jupyter notebooks and we will have a dedicated um, section on our website that will just point to to papers or the the github repositories with the corresponding code um, to, to advertise and tell people hey this has been implemented using shona this is how you can access it so it doesn't need to be really integrated into the shona core Mm -hmm. What is the license? Is this GPL or something else? No, no, GPL would be dangerous. So it's it's Apache um, 2.0. And um, so that is essentially allows, should allow anyone to use it, especially in industry, and you don't need to worry about infringing any patents. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why it's important. Yeah, so. because they'll fork it in principle. I mean, so there could be yeah. forks appearing, right? Um, of course, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yes. So, Emil, how are we doing on time? <laughs> yeah, I, I think we can have some some just short things. Uh, see, I think you wanted to ask something about MIMO decoding. Yes, um, MIMO decoding, uh, Jacob. Is that yeah, what about uh, it? <laughs> is it already there? I mean, in in Shiona integrated into the uh, say receiving yeah. end the toolbox. I, I I think you did some work. I mean, as yeah. you. No, I mean, I also work on my MIMO coding, right? But it's like 10 years, I think, <laughs> longer ago. Yeah. And on what at the time was, I think, state of the art, no doubt. But you have more recently, I think, been looking at, and, and also perhaps before you came to NVIDIA, at um, machine learning inspired algorithms for MIMO decoding. So what would you say currently is like state of the art there? I mean... <laughs> Um, yeah. Is it no longer the uh, fixed complexity uh, sphere decoder? And the, the my student developed, I think it was like probably 10 years ago now, the SUMIS algorithm that beat every benchmark we could come across. But I suppose in the last 10 years, has machine learning really taken over to dominate the field? Or could you could you comment on that? Yeah. Yeah, so 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 I think uh, sphere detection is very hard to beat. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there's always so, a complexity yeah. performance trade-off. Yeah, exactly. That's the point, exactly. right? So, so then yeah. the question is, what is the hardware platform you're running on? And if you're exactly. running on the uh, GPU farm or something, that's a different thing as compared to running on general purpose processor or an ASIC that's designed specifically for the detector. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I appreciate it's a hard question to 
to to answer or even to ask because <laughs> what does better mean here yeah yeah so i think sphere detection is not yet used uh, I, i'm not sure if anyone has actually implemented practically any commercial product just because of complexity no, no, but i wouldn't even consider that state of the art i mean i yeah. think uh, this fixed complexity um that's actually a misnomer right fixed complexity yeah. sphere you mean decoding, like k, -K best uh, sphere detection or something like this or no not really i mean there are these no. uh, fixed complexity algorithms that um aren't really sphere decoding but maybe it takes too far the discussion too far okay, to too talk too far. about these details <laughs> yeah, okay. now but maybe let, you can summarize um, like from a machine learning perspective what yeah. would you say so is the, the, the the problem there is the following um there has been in the last five years or so i don't know a few hundred papers on mm. oh is that learned, much learned, learned, followed, yeah, yeah, yeah it's really yeah. huge and the problem and I, I looked into this for a very long time and the problem is that almost all papers evaluate performance on the iid Rayleigh fading channel and then they show hey we are close to um, maximum likelihood and the problem is that that's very easy but as soon as you try these algorithms on for example one of these three gpp models uh, they, they totally fail and that some don't even converge anymore not at all and um and th that reminded me a bit of what what happened in the massive mimo um research community where people everybody was working on the iid Rayleigh fading model we, we we drew conclusions from it that turned out to be sometimes not so correct when you take a correlation into account and now we have the same problem here is that you, you go through this literature saying wow this is a great algorithm they get performance then you test it on an actual realistic channel model and it just doesn't work and so i haven't seen a single machine learning based um, decoder that would work well on this 3gpp model um, so there might be one, there has been a paper a couple of months ago using self-attention that looked great, but I haven't looked into it in detail. Um, so, but what, so what you are suggesting is that the way to go for MIMO detection is actually rather the classical algorithms then? I'm not sure yet. I, I, I haven't given up yet, but for until now I haven't, I can't report on any, I'm not aware of any real success story. Well, where, but that's actually good to know. I mean, uh, um, I wouldn't be too surprised if the answer is that the classical algorithms are actually the way to go. The only reservation against that might be that if if the precondition is that you are to implement this on a GPU, then there is a computational aspect where maybe the, the machine learning algorithms are just so much faster in some way. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, by the way, like I, I, I'm not advocating question, for yeah. implementing mm. the entire physical AI on the GPU. I mean, most mm. base mm. stations, you know, they run yeah. on an ASIC. So I know. I, so I, that's why I'm <laughs> saying there won't be a <laughs> GPU, right? <laughs> so I, I'm, um... Okay. I think we have covered most things. I had one last question for you because I remember we wrote a few years ago this massive mime is reality. What is next? Five promising research directions for antenna race. And and you were sort of assigned to, to write about something that has to do with um, AI machine learning. And, and then you brought up a topic that I haven't spent much time thinking about before, namely technical depth. So, so what is this and why is this a problem? Yeah. Okay. So now I, I, I mean, this has a notion in software engineering, but I just focus on the on the part with respect to machine learning systems here. So um, when you think about a complex system that has many components, such as many signal processing blocks or like an entire um, 5G RAN setup. Um, now, when you start to replace certain components in such a system by machine learning models, you might create unintentional dependencies. And, and that's what technical debt refers to in this context. So, for example, if you have um, one component that somehow influences the training data that is used for another component, then these two components are not independent anymore. Or imagine you have a chain of machine learning models where, where the changes in one model you know, impact the inputs to the next one. And this means if one of these models changes, all of the other models need to be retrained from scratch. And you totally lose, you know, you totally lose these nice independent blocks that you can optimize and, and test uh, independently of each other. So that's what meant by technical depth, and that's I think a problem that creeps into any system where you have multiple machine learning models um, operating together. And I, I think we have not seen this problem yet, as machine learning has not become like mainstream everywhere. But I think it's definitely going to happen. Yeah, so when if 6G networks are uh, ML or AI native, then this will be one of the topics that we will be talking much more about in the future, I suppose. I, 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 I'm inclined to believe so, yeah. 
Great. So, do you have any final words before we wrap this up? Final words. I mean, I, I obviously <laughs> I would like people to. I mean, I would people the listeners to to get started using Shona. And um, I mean, we have a we have put a lot of uh, love into actually our website and the the documentation. And um, if you want to give it a look, I mean, just just browse through the website. There are quite a few tutorials that I actually uh, think are also good for just to learn about digital communication. So I think it's actually also a cool tool for to teach. So it's not just for research, you can use it to teach. And these tutorials, you can run them directly in the browser. You don't need to install anything. And um, yeah, and I mean, otherwise, the only thing you need is a working Python environment. You do a pip install Shona and you're, you're ready to go. That's amazing. So, um, I think we're all inspired to go and download. Shiona yeah, has, yeah. Start and playing we will... <laughs> <laughs> with it. So, and we will put a link both to the white paper and to this website in the description of this episode. So, with that, uh, thank you very much. It has been a pleasure to have you here and talk about all of these things here and and challenge yeah. your uh, and get some of your your deep knowledge around machine learning. So, so thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jake. It was really fun. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.